Welcome, my name is Harald Sack. And I'm Antan. And this is Knowledge Graphs, lecture number five, Ontological Engineering for Smarter Knowledge Graphs. In this section of the lecture, we want to show you how to design your own ontology. Okay, let's think about this scenario. Say you were approached by a winery and they want to apply semantic web technologies in digitizing their product line. So that, for example, their um, scientists can come up with good wine or their users can browse through their whole um, product line. So how do we go about defining our ontology, or not just any ontology, but a great ontology? Okay, we have to follow specific methodologies. And the most simple one is the one that has been introduced already more than 20 years ago. It's called Ontology 1 and 1. It was always meant to be a toy example for students, but now many ontologies have been defined exactly in exactly that way. So therefore, we are showing you how, to, how this works in principle. So as you see here, the ontology development process, let me simply here turn on my laser pointer, is divided into several steps that we will now go through piece by piece. And of course, in practice, ontology development always is an iterative process. And as you see here, it repeats continuously because what you do, of course, you do something, you do a specific definition mm -hmm. and then you try to evaluate it afterwards. And that, of course, might change things. So it's a constant development process. And of course, also while you are defining the ontology or while you are using ontology, the environment reality might mm -hmm. change sure. and then you have to adapt it. And of course, there are always different approaches for modeling an ontology, which might fit best for a specific, let's say, purpose or a specific environment. And the point is the designated application in the end decides exactly what kind of modeling you should choose. Keep in mind, there is no one correct way to model a domain. There are always viable alternatives. Okay, so let's start. So the first thing we need to consider is the scope or the domain or the focus of our ontology. So we need to ask ourselves which domain should be covered by this ontology and what should the ontology be used for? What kind of applications are we going to build on top of this ontology? Also, it's important to consider who will use and maintain the ontology. I already um, mentioned, is the ontology going to be used by scientists? by normal users, who will use ontology? This, these are very important questions. And last but not the least, what types of questions should be answered by the knowledge represented in the ontology? So these questions, by these questions, I mean what are the competency questions? So what are competency questions? Um, in the context of wine ontology, competency questions would be something like, which properties of wine should be considered for modeling, or which kind of wine matches best with specific dish, and so on. And these competency questions are not only formulated by the ontology designer, but also, most importantly, by the domain experts and the users themselves. And keep in mind that these questions might change all throughout the ontology design life cycle. So some questions might be removed, others might be added. So this is a dynamic list of competency questions. Yes, and you are completely right. It's important here that we have domain experts on the one hand side mm -hmm. who are the experts of the field and the domain, what the ontology should be created for, and the knowledge engineers. Mm -hmm. Simply because the domain experts have no ideas on how to construct an ontology and the knowledge engineers usually don't have any idea about the field for which they are creating something. And of course, it, it's not the only ontology you do in your lifetime, so there will be many domains and you can't be expert of all of the domains. So therefore, it's important that we bring together these mm -hmm. two group of people. Yeah, correct. And also, it's important to note that if you look through the competency questions, you see that the questions are all formulated in natural language. Mm -hmm. And this is because you have two different groups of people coming together to come up with the perfect ontology. And 
um, describing these competency questions using natural language would be the most optimal way so that these group of people can understand each other much better. Exactly. So then the point, as soon as we switch then over to formal expressions, then we are already halfway gone because um, in the beginning, of course, the domain experts should, as Anne said, closely be involved in the process and understand what's going on. As soon as we start then with formal definitions, most of the domain experts are out and can't tell really what's going on there anymore. Okay, but let's continue. Before you start the endeavor to create a new huge ontology, look around yourself because there might be already, already something out there that's uh, well suited for reuse. Why should we consider reuse? Quite simple, in order to save costs or in order to apply tools that are applied to other existing ontologies, also to your own ontology, or in order to reuse ontologies that have been validated by the replication. So there are many reasons, especially, I mean, cost is a reason always in industry, so therefore consider reuse. Also, if you can't, let's say, completely use an already existing ontology, you might import parts of it or you might take something and change it. This is sometimes even, let's say, much more efficient than to think of something again and to reinvent the wheel. Okay, let's continue. Okay, so the next step would be the development of our terminology. This means that then we will start to enumerate our terms. Terms that actually stand for the concepts that we need to represent. And these concepts should be appropriate to the domain that we are work designing the ontology for. On top of that, we also need to define the properties, properties that describe the concepts that you have identified. So, in short, other than concepts and properties, we also want to answer the question, what do we want to say about these concepts? So, in the context of a wine ontology, a possible concept would be definitely wine, grape, uh, winery, or the location of the vineyard, and so on. And if you were to be more specialized about it, you can describe, for example, properties of wine, like body, flavor, sugar content, and so on, as well as types or subtypes of wine, like white wine, red wine. And if you want to be more specific, you can talk about Bordeaux or whatever else <laughs> wine there are. And also, you can also describe other concepts that you can relate to the existing concepts in the wine ontology. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So what you are doing there, you are asking your domain experts, tell me what's important. What do you want to see there in the ontology? What are the important terms that we have to talk about? Mm -hmm. And then you get in conversation with them and note down all what you hear. And then you end up with a list like we see here in the example. Okay, these are the terms. Next thing we have to see, we have to look at the terms that we have collected. And from that we have to decide, okay, what, which of these terms make up and are well suited to define classes. You will easily identify them, like for example, we will see, okay, we were talking about different kinds of wines, so therefore wines would be an interesting class. Probably we have also talked about wineries who produce wine. There are different wineries we will be talking about. So the class of wineries might also be um, interesting. And then to be more precise, of course, uh, specific wines are, for example, red wines or white wines, and that might also become classes. So classes in general, we know that are collections of objects mm -hmm. with similar properties. And how to do that? There are different ways, for example, because what we have to create here are hierarchies of classes. We have to relate the classes to each other. And to do that, we can do this starting from the top, that would be top down. We can start then also from the button, bottom up also, we can start middle out. So let's see how this works. I start with top down. If you start top down, you say, yeah, for me it's important that I divide the world according to my needs. So I start with the most general concept. So in the wine ontology, what are we talking about? We are talking about beverages. Mm -hmm. How can I distinguish beverages? If I want to include wine on one side, of course, I can say, yeah, we have alcoholic beverages and probably non-alcoholic beverages. That's the world of beverages. 
I'm of course more interested than on the alcoholic side if I want to do the wine stuff. So then I dif distinguished, for example, wine and beer. And on the non-alcoholic side, I might, for example, say soda and tonic. There are more things. So you see there, there is not only one possibility to create a class hierarchy. And then in the wines, it might be interesting for me then to distinguish between white wine, red wine and rosé wine. Mm -hmm. So that would be then a very nice top-down approach to create a class hierarchy. So far, so good. Let's start bottom up the other way around. With the bottom-up approach, we start out with the most specialized and most concrete concept that we have. So here we have Bordeaux white wine, we have Chardonnay white wine, we have Merlot red wine and Bordeaux red wine. And then we look at these concepts or classes and find out what they have in common. So for example, the first two types of wines, Bordeaux and Chardonnay, they are both white wine. While the last two, they are both red wine. Then we get our superclass or superclasses. So the first two, they are white wine, and the last two, they are red wine. And then we look again at these two superclasses and think again what they have in common. They are both wines. Yes, and wine is a type of alcoholic beverage. Yes, so bottom up. Great, so you see this already results in another class hierarchy. Mm -hmm. Simply, the difference is if you start from the top or if you start from the bottom. And there is a third one. So for example, if you decide, no, the most important thing for me is somewhere in the middle. I want to distinguish white wine, Bordeaux wine and red wine. This would be then a middle out approach because then I would have to continue farther down and also farther up. Let's go first down. So if I look there, white wines, we have two in our assortment. So we have classes of Chardonnay white wine and we have Bordeaux white wine. And then of course for Bordeaux wine, we would have Bordeaux white and Bordeaux red. And for the red wines, we have again, the Bordeaux red wine and the Merlot red wine. Now combining the stuff together, we see then all of these three are wines and they are alcoholic beverages. And I have a third class hierarchy, again, different. Mm -hmm. So they are, none of them is really right or wrong in a universal sense. They are all, of course, now important or the right thing for a specific intention, for a specific purpose, for a specific application. Keep this in mind. There will never be a single ontology which is always right for all situations. That will mm -hmm. never happen. Okay, so let's continue and define properties. Yes, so now that we have the classes, we need to be able to define the properties that describe these classes. So here we show you a screenshot of Protégé, and here we can see that we have defined um, object properties, which are synonymous to the relationships that exist between classes, as well as define property relationships here on the character panel, and so on. And uh, for example, a property we can define under the concept of wine, we can define has color or has residual sugar or has producer and so on. So these are very important uh, things that we have to consider when we define our properties. Okay, and the next thing, you know that already, to further put semantics on the properties, we could define property constraints, simply to describe or restrict the set of possible property values. For example, we could say that the name of a wine has to be a string. The producer of an instance of a winemaker, uh, the producer is an instance of a winemaker and so on. So property constraints would be then the next thing that we create before, and this is then the final thing what we have to do, we have of course to populate our ontology. This means you create instances for the classes and then of course every class becomes the type of its instances. And also with that, you know, every mm -hmm. superclass that you have def defined uh, of a direct type then also is the, the type of its instances. So we create instances also then for properties, which means we do an assignment of a property uh, value for instances according to the given constraint. So then I could also phrase something like the glass of red wine that I drank last supper. Which was? I didn't. <laughs> okay. Yeah, 
I had a non-alcoholic beer. Okay, good for you. Okay. So, as you can see, ontology development process is not straightforward. So you go back from each of the every steps that you have. You come, for example, when you have already created your instances, it is likely that you will go back again to define your properties or even go way, way back and consider reuse. So ontology development in practice is an iterative process that repeats continuously and improves the ontology. So my question in the very beginning, can we make a great ontology? And the, question, the answer to this question is yes, but it's not very straightforward. It's a cycle. Sure. Yeah. And of course, keep in mind, there is no one correct way True. to model a domain. There are always viable alternatives, as we said in the beginning. And in the same sense that there is not a single or let's say n not one uh, only ontology for a given problem, also there exists, of course, many different methodologies for building mm. ontologies. So what we saw now was only the simplest one, a toy example. There are, of course, more professional methodologies. One of them I want to quickly talk about is the so-called unified process for ontology building that has been introduced already in 2005 by Nikola Misikov and Navigli. And um, there, the development is divided also again into mm -hmm. cycles. It's broken down and subdivises into phases. So it has phases of iterations. And the iter all these phases, they always begin with an inception, then they do an elaboration, a construction, and then a transition to the next phase. So each iteration results then in a new prototype. Mm -hmm. And again, iterations itself, they have workflows, so usually five workflows. They start always with a requirements analysis. Uh, so first stating the requirements, then do an analysis of the requirements, then start your design, implement your design, and then test the stuff. Mm -hmm. So this is then a more, let's say, engineering related approach for creating ontologies. Mm -hmm. But one can do even better. Yes, so luckily for us, um, Ganjemi, formulated the ontology design patterns. And this is uh, adapted from the book by Christopher Alexander called A Pattern Language, which is an architectural book on design patterns. And Christopher Alexander said that in architecture, there are recurring modeling problems. For instance, if you build a house or a building, there will always be doors and there will always be windows and doors will always be rectangular. I know Lord of the Rings fans will violently protest, but let's just say in architecture, the doors will always be <laughs> rectangular. So um, in this book, Christopher Alexander said that a pattern is a solution to a problem in a given context. So each pattern here describes a problem that occurs over and over. So if this problem occurs or reoccurs, why do we have to come up with solutions over and over when we can define standard way of solving these problems? Mm -hmm. And the ontology design patterns try to do this for us. True. Mm -hmm. So then, now you know how to design ontologies, but we can even do better. So now, in the next lecture, you will learn how we distinguish between designing good or bad ontologies.